Okay, let's open our Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 3. Matthew, chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3, we're going to begin at verse 13. I think I mentioned 15 on that note, Grace, but it should be verse 13. Matthew 3, starting at verse 13. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee. And comest thou to me? Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now. For thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. To suffer simply means to allow, to permit. When you have to contend with something for a while, you suffer because you have to keep putting up with it. And so in that sense that you're allowing something, you're permitting something. John has a revelation that uh, the Messiah would be shown to him. Go keep your finger here. Go forward to John chapter 1. John chapter 1, notice John, Gospel of John chapter 1, verse 33. John the Baptist said, and I knew him not, but that he, excuse me, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. And of course, Christ had his own agenda from the Heavenly Father. Look over at John 1 and start there at verse 6. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lieth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. I'm glad I believed on the name of the Lord Jesus. Back to our text says in verse 15, For thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. These words show the purpose of water baptism, to indicate righteousness. Before the resurrection of Christ, it indicated a person was seeking righteousness by submitting to the one who was baptizing. After the resurrection of Christ, it indicates that you've already found it in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, it, it, is, it, is a, it has a spiritual meaning for the believer. And that's about all you can say. Go forward to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. And this is the passage which is partially or half quoted by every liberal Protestant, by Roman Catholics and by cult members to prove that water baptism is necessary for the saving of your soul. 1 Peter 3, and I'll start at verse 19. By which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. This is Christ after he died on Calvary. Verse 20, which sometime were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. The like figure, whereunto even baptism doth, doth also now save us. That's where the cult members stop. They stop at that point and say, see, water baptism saves you. But what did it save Noah's family from? Did it save their souls or did it save them from being drowned? Save them from being drowned had nothing to do with the saving of their souls. Not at the time. Now the parentheses, verse 21, the verse continues, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, the idea that water baptism or submitting to 
water baptism by a minister or a priest or some other church official somehow gets rid of every sin, every corruption you ever committed, you ever performed, somehow that's all washed away by you being baptized, is false. Peter says, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Water baptism uh, indicates that you have been washed clean already from your sins, and now your conscience is toward God. Water baptism is a picture of your salvation, but it's not the means, it's not the method of your salvation. It's a picture of your salvation, but it's not salvation itself. It has a spiritual meaning. It's not necessary for salvation. In 1 Corinthians 15, I think we covered this recently, the Apostle Paul said he preached the gospel that Christ sent him to preach, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. He said that was the gospel, the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it was done on the sinner's behalf, for the sake of the sinner, as a substitute for the sinner. And the sinner that puts his trust in that has the grace of God bestowed upon him, and all of his sins are put upon Christ. And a great transaction takes place, but can only take place in the heart by faith. Some outward physical action can't affect some spiritual change on the inside. It's a, a, a spiritual relationship you enter into with God by faith. That's the only way you can come to know God is by faith. And then he says in the first chapter of that same book, 1 Corinthians 1, verse 17, the Apostle Paul says, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. So if the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection, and Christ didn't send him to be baptizing anybody, that means that water baptism is not part of salvation. It's not necessary. It's not a requirement to be saved. When Christ died on the cross, one of the thieves next to him believed on Christ, and the Lord said, This day thou shalt be with me in paradise. And they came along and they broke the soldiers' legs to hasten their death, help them to die more quickly. When they came to Jesus, they found he was dead before them. He was already dead. So they didn't break his legs. That means Christ died before they died. And therefore, in just that short time, between the time Christ died and the time those sinners died, those, those criminals died, Christ had, all, had fixed it all up. He had made a way for that sinner to, who did believe to re be received into paradise, into heaven, with him that very day. Amen. And the sinner never had a chance to get baptized. He was the very first one saved in the church. He was, talk about believing uh, in the blood shed of Christ, in the, in the shed blood of Jesus Christ. He could actually see the blood on the cross next to him. And he believed, and he believed, uh, he was the very first one to believe in the death of the Lord Jesus Christ um, and, the, and the power of the blood of Christ. But um, verses 16 and 17 in our text. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And, a vo and lo, a voice from heaven, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. The words, he went up straightway out of the water, should, should settle the issue, finally, that water baptism in the New Testament is by immersion. It's not sprinkling on the forehead. You know, uh, I thought about maybe some modern church could, could be, you know, sacrilegious like so many of them are and uh, adopt a new form of water baptism by just uh, filling up water balloons, you know, and have all the church members just bombard, just bombard the new convert until they're completely drenched, uh, or a dunking booth, you know, <laughs> hit the target and the guy drops in. Don't, listen, don't put it past somebody to pull something that ridiculous, or those super soaker squirt guns, you know, here. There's no reason to, to take what's simply described in the Bible and modify it or change it. Um, water baptism in the New Testament is by full immersion, not just sprinkling on the forehead. 
Colossians 2, verse 12, says, Buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him, so forth. Water baptism pictures Christ's burial and your identification with him. Just as he was buried in the tomb in a similar way, a, a dramatic uh, way of uh, acting it out, you are buried in the water and come up as a new person. You're indicating a change has taken place on the inside. And this is the way you illustrate it by being baptized in water and coming up uh, now with a conscience, uh, uh, a clear conscience toward God, wanting to live for God now. You're indicating that my old nature, my old person that wanted to satisfy itself and only serve itself, I'm going to consider to be dead. Just as Christ died for my sin and he was buried, my old nature, I'm going to consider it to be dead. And now my new nature wants to live for God. My new nature wants to please Jesus Christ. But the water itself does nothing. It's just an act. It's an, it's, it's an action, I should say that we carry out as obedient believers in Jesus Christ. And uh, it's a picture of your salvation, but it's not salvation in itself. Now, in our text, three persons of the Godhead are manifested. There is the Father's voice from heaven. There is the Son coming up out of the water. And then the Holy Spirit descending in the form of a dove. I don't understand these people who read the Bible and uh, they still don't think there's a triune nature. Now, the word Trinity isn't in the Bible, but the definition is. The word Godhead is what the Bible uses. The, the triune nature of three persons of the Godhead, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. He says, this is my beloved Son. That also makes Christ unique among all men who have ever lived. He's the first Son born of God. Romans 1 and verse 4 says, And declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Um, he's the only begotten, in the sense that the new birth is not mentioned until Christ appears in the world, as the first in a line of sons. Hebrews 3 verse 6 says, but Christ as a son over his own house, which house are we if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end? He's also the only begotten um, in the sense that although others after him are said to be born of God, John 1 verse 13, uh, they are, uh, they're not physically born of God. We all had human fathers and mothers. Christ only had a human mother. The Heavenly Father was his father. Now, Matthew chapter 4. Uh, I think we started this about, oh, close to three months ago. And we're finally reaching chapter 4. So congratulations to us. Uh, if we were at Calvary Chapel, they would have finished the entire book of Matthew by now, the, the deep study of the word. They read a few texts, make a few devotional comments, and move on to the next chapter. That's about as far as they get. They don't believe in rightly dividing the word of truth because they don't have one single book that they regard as the perfect word of God in their hands. You have to believe that first before you can then begin comparing scripture with scripture and let it interpret itself. If you don't have access to the words of God, then you can't read the words of God. It's impossible for you to read the word of God and be obedient to the word of God if you don't have it. The word of your church, the word of your minister, the word of some uh, um, organization, that's not the word of God. The word of God is a book God's been willing to give you and I. We hold in our hands and we read on the pages in front of us. This is the word of God. Chapter 4, verse 1, Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Turn over one page to Matthew chapter 6, verse 13. Here's part of the Lord's Prayer, as it's called. Matthew 6, verse 13, 
and lead us not into temptation. That's, uh, we'll see, there's a contradiction in the Bible. Those two verses. Christ was led to be tempted, and then he says, pray that you won't be led into temptation. Um, if... Christ, if the Jews were taught to pray, lead us not into temptation, then why was Christ led to be tempted? Someone might say, well, clearly, this is a case where a knowledge of, of New Testament Greek and different words for lead and tempt and so forth are necessary before you can make sense of the scripture. Actually, it's not. Actually, that's not necessary. I've said to you before, uh, if you want to learn the English Bible, what you ought to do is learn English. You'd think that'd be self-evident, <laughs> but it's not so self-evident to a lot of people. I want to learn, we have friends from uh, visiting from Venice, Italy. If I wanted to learn how to discern an Italian Bible, what I ought to do first is learn the, the, the Italian language. That would be one of the best things to do, first of all. Same with the Korean King James Bible or a Spanish Bible or any other language. If you want to learn that Bible, then learn that language first. But actually, it's not necessary. Go back to the book of Genesis. Keep your finger here in our text. Genesis chapter 22. Genesis 22. Notice verse 1. Genesis 22, it says, And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. Now go forward to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews 11. Notice there, Verse 17, it says, By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, so forth. So it says God tempted Abraham, but it also, it defines it here, God tried him. He was putting him to a test. Tempt was a test. It was not an invitation to commit some evil act. Look at uh, James, the next book, the book of James, chapter 1. James chapter 1 and verses 12 to 14. James 1 verses 12 to 14. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. So, to be tempted, as Christ was tempted, meant to be tested. Chapter 4 in our text again, verse 1, Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Since the Bible always takes for granted the existence of a literal personal devil, Satan, so should the Bible believer take it for granted. You should assume that the Bible knows what it's talking about. The, the devil, or Satan, is not just a principle. He's not just a negative influence in, in life. Look forward at Matthew chapter 12. Matthew 12. And notice there verse... Oh, verse 26, Christ says, Matthew 12, verse 26, And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How shall then his kingdom stand? And uh, go forward to First Peter chapter 5. I know I'm having you turn back and forth a lot, but it's necessary, and you need to learn how to do it anyway. First Peter chapter 5. First Peter five. 
own fingers working here. 1 Peter 5 and verse 8 says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. The sentence continues, verse 9, Whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions in the comp are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Whom resist? Satan or the devil in the Bible has personality. He's a literal uh, person or personality. He exists, and uh, he's busy trying to destroy you as a believer in Jesus Christ. He's busy trying to set up roadblocks to keep you from succeeding. He's busy trying to um, tempt you or entice your flesh with something you shouldn't be doing, which would not be which would not reflect well on the Lord Jesus Christ, which would distract your attention from spiritual things uh, onto carnal things. You know, if the devil can simply get your attention off of the Lord Jesus Christ and onto something else, he's won a great victory. You might not be an outright, deliberate Satan worshiper, but if you're not worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ and you're preoccupied with some other thing, whether it's golf or whether it's your next vacation or whether it's a video game or you're preoccupied with any number of some hobby, you belong to an old car club, you like to plant flowers in your garden, you, you, any number of occupations that takes up more of your time than your attention given to the Lord Jesus Christ, that becomes idolatry. Let your moderation be known to all men, the Lord is at hand so you don't get extreme now, yeah you can enjoy uh, working in your garden you can enjoy having a nice car that not everybody has you can or an old collector's car a lot of guys are really big into that you can enjoy those things but if that consumes your attention all the time so you neglect your spiritual duty to God then shame on you you're not moderate at all you are obsessed with some hobby, some pastime, something over here. If you stop reading your Bible because now you're doing this all the time, then you're not moderate. You're not well balanced. You are obsessed with this. Doesn't the Bible say in one place that they have addicted themselves to the gospel? The only addiction you ought to have is to the word of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ. How do I get this information into other people's hearts and minds? That's the only addiction you need to uh, try to form. Not an addiction to sports, not an addiction to just religious ritual, not an, an addiction to any number of other pastimes and hobbies, but an addiction to know more about the Lord Jesus Christ, more about Jesus what I know, more of his grace to others show. More about Jesus in his word, holding communion with my Lord, hearing his voice in every line, making each faithful saying mine. If you don't regard the word of God, if you don't regard the Bible God gave you, a lot has been sacrificed over history for you to have a copy of the Bible, to just let it sit on the shelf and not read it. God help you. God help you. You're sinning. And the, the, the truth is, you know you're sinning. I don't really have to tell you. You don't like me telling you. But you are. You're neglecting your Bible. You're neglecting prayer. You're neglecting to seek after the will of God, and the move in the direction and leading of the Holy Spirit of God. People like to be ignorant because if I don't read it in the Bible, then I can't be held accountable for it. Well, if that's your Bible, yeah, it's your Bible. Is it sitting on your shelf? Yeah. Is it sitting in your house? Yeah. Has it got your name written in the front? Yeah. Then, then you're accountable for it. You know, uh, Dr. Ruckman used to illustrate it this way. You drive down the highway, and uh, you run a red light, and the, the sheriff or the police or highway patrol pull you over, and they want to give you a citation for running a, a traffic stop, and you say, well, I didn't see it. And he would say, you know, if you want, we can go back and take a look at it. You're going to get a ticket anyway. 
because you could have seen it if you were paying attention. If you'd been looking, if you were aware of what was around you, you'd have seen it. You'd have seen that you, shouldn't, you should have stopped, should have paid attention. And the same thing applies to the Word of God. Those things that you ought to know about living for Jesus Christ, being the kind of believer, a man or a woman, that brings honor to your Savior. Don't be the kind that brings disgrace to the Lord Jesus and then shame and disgrace to other believers by association. You don't want to be like that. But um, the Word of God talks about Satan as a real entity, a real personal devil and literal. Chapter 4 and verse 2 says, And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. In the Bible, 40 stands for testing and preparation. Moses fed uh, sheep in the wilderness for 40 years before he was ready to go lead Israel out of Egypt. And the Israelites wandered for 40 years before they were able to conquer the Canaanites. By the time they went into the land of Canaan, they had been on field maneuvers for 40 years. There's not an army in the world that could have stand, stood up to the nation of Israel at that time. They were battle-hardened. I mean, living outdoors, picking up and moving, setting down your tents day after day after day after day, month after month, year after year. Goliath came out <clears throat> to challenge the army of Israel in uh, 1 Samuel 17, verse 16, for 40 days to test their resolve before David showed up. Verse 2 says, afterward and hungered. He began to be in hunger. Yeah, after 40 days, you would be hungry. But um, this gives the natural impression that after 40 days, then Satan came to Christ with the temptations. That may not be exactly how it came to be. Look forward at Luke's account. Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4, Luke chapter 4, and notice the language of verses 1 and 2. And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Now pay attention. Being 40 days tempted of the devil. And in those days he did eat nothing. When they were ended, he afterward hungered. So it may be the temptations were ongoing throughout that 40 days, especially the temptation to command these stones to be made bread. Christ lasted 40 days without yielding to the temptation of Satan. But he kept persisting nevertheless. Do you know, I've been working on a book, and I've been kind of at a, a mental block, a writer's block, I should say, mental block too, but a writer's block for about the last six months, on um, the Bible Believer's Guide to Buddhism. I don't think anyone's ever attempted that subject. The story of Gautama Siddhartha, the supposed Buddha, matches the story of Christ in a number of particulars. So much so that it's obvious the legend of the Buddha was created to compete with the story of Christ. They say that the Buddha lived 500 years before the time of Christ in India. However, India never converted to Buddhism. They kept on, they held on to their Hinduism, which went back a thousand years before that. When the ideas of Buddha were spread into China, the Chinese really grabbed a hold of it. The Chinese embraced Buddhism, but the Indians did not. Have you ever noticed the artwork? Notice the artwork. Most the images, now there's some exceptions, but most images of the supposed Buddha has a very Asiatic, Shemitic look. He doesn't have the Indo-European facial features that Indian people have. Buddhism really took hold in China. But by the time 
the Chinese began to embrace this story of Buddha, Christianity and the gospel of Christ was already being preached in China. By 400 years after the time of Christ, Buddhism began to take hold. Christianity and the gospel was being preached in China well before the story of the Buddha ever took off. If the Buddha lived 500 years before Christ, the very first biographies of the Buddha weren't written until 100 years after Christ. That's 600 years when it was just word of mouth, just telling a tale, telling a story, and nothing was written down, nothing was official. The first story of the life of the Buddha wasn't written until 100 years after Christ. And the Apostle Thomas, one of the 12 apostles, uh, by just about all church records agree, Thomas went as far away as India preaching the gospel of Christ by 46, 47 AD. I mean, the apostles, they went everywhere. And Thomas is credited with going as far away as India preaching Jesus Christ 47 AD. And uh, when people began to embrace Jesus Christ and the gospel of Christ uh, there, that story began to spread. And the Chinese naturally needed some story uh, to compete with that. So they create this legend, this mythology, about one of their own people, or someone in that part of the world. They, they say it was a myth that started in India and then finally came to China. That way, it's, it, you know, the origins were in another country. You really can't put it together. You can't really trace the origins of it. You can't narrow down the actual facts of it. All we know is that we believe it here in China. They had one of their own. They say he had a miraculous birth. His mother saw this elephant come out of the sky in a vision with six tusks out of its mouth and entered into her side. And the next morning she was found with child expecting a baby. And, um, you know, they count months, a, a lunar month, about 29, 30 days. Um, we count solar months, which sometimes are a little longer, a solar calendar. So they say the Buddha was born 10 months after conception, which is reasonable when they counted time, uh, the length of dates, rather the length of months differently than we do. And his mother was traveling back to her homeland to give birth among her relatives. And along the way, they stopped at a place called Lumbini Grove. And this is a place where trees were growing. And she found this quiet place to rest under. And it was there under these trees that she gave birth to the so-called Buddha. And uh, that matches the, the, the birth of Christ in a manger, right? No room to lay, no place to lay his head. Um, miraculous conception, the, the uh, birth without a proper shelter. And when uh, he was born, some wise men traveled to talk to his father and say, he will either become a great religious leader or he will become a great king, just as you are. And uh, he'll become a great religious leader if he learns about the suffering in the world. If he learns about the suffering in the world, this will provoke him to try to find a way to help those people. So to prevent his son from having a religious career, the story goes, the father got rid of all the sickly people in his kingdom so that his son would not see anybody that was sick or deformed or suffering. He wouldn't even see anyone die until he was 29 years old and he saw people carrying a dead man to his uh, cremation site. That's the first time he ever learned that people suffer, people get old, people die. Which is pretty ridiculous when you think that birds die, cats die, dogs die, and animals around you die. And it's pretty hard to shield somebody from the reality of death all their life until they're 29, 30 years old. That's uh, very uh, impractical. But this is how the story goes. But they have a number. And, and he sat under a tree to meditate and great, uh, receive great enlightenment. And while sitting there meditating, he was met by three different uh, demons who offered him riches. They offered him a kingdom. They offered him great power, just like Christ's temptations in the wilderness. So they have a number of things that parallel the story of Christ. But this was one of our own, one of our own people here in China we can believe in, or in India, we can believe in. 
That way they don't believe in a savior over in the other side of Palestine who died for the sake of sinners. This keep people believing in something local. And uh, the story of the Buddha it is a cheap copy of the Lord Jesus Christ. It really is. Uh, but if we keep saying it happened so long ago, pretty soon you can't trace the facts, the, the details, and see whether it happened at all. The story of the Buddha is a myth. He never existed. Just like the story of Santa Claus is a myth. He never existed. You look up the story of Santa Claus, and I'm just going to use Wikipedia as a, as a, a reference because I did read some of that. And the story of Santa Claus is there was a, a Catholic monk in Turkey in the 4th century, 300s. And there was a, there was a man who had three daughters and uh, they had no dowry, they had no money, nothing to their own name. And uh, what man would want to marry a poor girl? So this monk, Saint Nicholas, were, would go by and every night he would drop little bags of gold coins into their open window of the, where these young girls lived and uh, anonymously and this is where they got the money so they now they had money and some man might be willing to marry me because I'm not going to be a burden to him and that's just that's all there is to know about Saint Nicholas that's all there is to know they do say that if they didn't have money then they would have been forced to go into prostitution to support themselves. I don't know why they added that. But I've told you all there is to know about St. Nicholas. That's all there is to know. And it's sketchy whether such a person even existed. And uh, not only that, where did he get all the gold from? So they have a lot of questions they don't ask and they don't want to be answered. But that's all there is to know about St. Nicholas and from that They've created this whole story of Santa Claus giving presents to children and so forth. You know, when the Bible says the wise men opened unto him gifts, gold, and frankincense, and myrrh, that one verse we read in our sermon time, do you know how much has been based on that one verse? There are people at the shopping mall fighting over a parking spot right now. There are people worried about getting their bratty granddaughter an electric guitar or their kid a game system or a new... Uh, uh, iPhone or a new laptop or a pair of sunglasses or they're we're worried about getting any number of things Uncle Fred needs a new power sander uh, they get all these crazy ideas about gift giving all based on that one verse all of that based on one verse this is why I said that Christmas perpetuates a lot of mythology and stimulates a lot of wrong ideas about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ It's amazing how the world has taken one shred of a story and created an entire belief. That, and, and the story of Santa Claus gets bigger and bigger and bigger every year, right? It's not just Santa Claus. It, it's sort of like in the Buddha, you have the fat, jolly Buddha, and sometimes you have the skinny Buddha, right? In the imagery. Well, sometimes you have a fat Santa Claus, and sometimes there's a skinny Santa Claus in the old artwork in the 1800s. Kind of like the fat Elvis and the skinny Elvis. Thank you very much. It's all just, it's ridiculous. It really is. And yet the legend gets bigger and bigger and bigger. The, the sleigh and the reindeer and the Rudolph and the elves and the North Pole and the chimney and every, all of that all created from a mythological character, a figure that never existed. However, in the Lord Jesus Christ, we have accurate records of his birth. We have accurate historic documents documenting his birth and his life and his miracles and his unique life among uh, the, the first century Jews and his followers. Roman authorities said so. Roman authorities wrote about Christ one man named Pliny the Younger, as a Roman official, wrote in 110 A.D. that uh, he was in, in the country of Turkey, that those who considered themselves Christians considered, regarded Christ as God. 110 A.D., his followers had not forsaken him. They still believed in him. And uh, 
We have Josephus writings about 90 AD of the life of Christ. He wasn't even saved. He was an unsaved Jew, his Jewish historian who wrote about Christ's life and his ministry and performed wonderful miracles that uh, had been foretold by prophets. So we don't believe in a mythological character. We believe in a real person. We believe in the power of the word of God. We believe in the power of the son of God. It's interesting that the book we hold in our hands, we call this the word of God. And the savior who lives inside of us is called the word of God. You can't, you can't have a good picture of Jesus Christ unless you learn about him from the book. And you can't understand the book until you know Jesus Christ. Amen. One depends on the other. You can't say, well, I believe in Jesus, but I don't know anything about the Bible. Or I believe the Bible, but I don't want to know about Jesus. You can't, you have to have them both. They both complement each other and they depend on each other.